Fun. So these quantum numbers are a unique address for each electron present. But they have, again, real consequences for what we're looking at. So we can look at a series of quantum numbers and it tells us unique information about locations and things like that within the atom. But what do they describe? What do they describe? You plug these quantum numbers into a, um, the wave function and you can get out a probability region where the electrons exist. And so the wave function, so the wave function and its quantum numbers all relate to a probability region. Now they're not directly, you have to square the wave function. But. And so related to this is the probability function of finding the electron in a given region of space. Plug it in at a certain energy, where will the electron be? And so you plug these in, you run the calculation, and you get regions space. So let's take a look at the simplest one, the 1s electron. Now, if we look at um, n is equal to 1, primary energy level 1, and I'm going to show you a three-dimensional view, and it looks like a little sphere, n is equal to 1, l can only have the values of 0 to n minus 1, or in this case, 0. Right? This would describe, whenever you see L is equal to 0, that describes an S orbital, the lowest energy orbital in the system. An S subshell, the lowest energy subshell in the system. And electron values, M sub L, could only have the values of L0 up to L, in this case 0 to 0 or 0. But you could also have m sub s values, and there's two potential m sub s values. Well, what that means is that an s orbital in the first subshell, the only thing you can have, will only hold two electrons. We already know that. All right? We know that s orbitals hold two electrons. Just for giggles, we know that l is equal to 1 would be considered a p subshell, l would equal 2 would be considered a d subshell, and then f etc 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 which also makes sense considering m sub l has a potential to hold up to 10 electrons for a d subshell but this is what an electron populating in there would look like and it doesn't look very uh interesting you know you're spinning it around it doesn't look like it's doing anything but in reality this is a three-dimensional sphere and so if we put a slice through it and cut it right down the middle you can see that you can see that um, this would represent the probability of finding an electron. And we see is that the, the probability starts low, and then as we get closer and closer and closer and closer to the nucleus, the probability goes up, 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 up. And then it tapers back off again. So another, another illustration of this, you can plot the distribution sort of like as a s s dot, similar to our previous picture. Or if you just put a, you know, you say, oh, I'm going to say 90% of the electron density. If I have the probability of finding the electron here 90% of the time, it sort of looks like a sphere, which is exactly what it does. It looks like a sphere. In other words, it has a spherical electron distribution. All s orbitals look like this. They have this sort of spherical electron distribution. Underneath, things get a little bit more interesting. So n is equal to 2. Again, what's 0, though it could also have l is equal to 1. That would be a valid value for an n is equal to 2. It wouldn't be a value valid for n is equal to 1, principal quantum number equal to 1. Second energy level has two subshells, an s and a p. So if we take a look at the 2s orbital, n is equal to 2, s orbital, what we see is something slightly different. So if we show it in two dimensions, again, it's still spherical, but we sort of see this sort of um, electron density, and then it sort of grow, grows, grows, and then it starts to fade again. And this would represent a node. Again, these are waves in three dimensions. And just like our standing wave has nodes at either end, as well as whatever develops in the middle. And so 
um, if we get rid of the slice, I'm not cutting through it, it just, again, it's not very interesting to look at. It's spherical, and there's sort of highlights. You can't really see the node in there. The boundary outside to the rest of the universe looks pretty much like the, the 1s orbital. Spherical, and there's a node in the middle. Again, these nodes are not accessible. These are not like... These are on the interior of the atom. This is on the periphery. Nucleus is here. This would represent delving deeper and deeper into the electronic structure of the atom. And at the S, 2s level, you're actually fairly close. And this places the bulk of the electron probability out in the periphery. Now, what's interesting is that there is still electron density at the nucleus. You move away, it fades off to the node, and then it comes back out in the periphery. The bulk of the electron density resides at the periphery, though. This is a trend you see over and over. As you move further and further away, the electrons reside further and further away from the nucleus. This has important implications when we get to um, periodic trends. All right, nothing too exciting to see. But if we switch from L is equal to 0 to L is equal to 1, we see a radical change in the, the electron density. Rather than being spherical, we now have a node that develops right at the nucleus. Orbitals within the S subshell are nice and symmetric. They're nice and round. It's nice. And so if we draw the atom, you know, the nucleus is in the central center. This sort of like spherical shape represents the probability of finding the electron. It's sort of this nice spherical distribution. But when we get to p orbitals, l is equal to 0, we plug those in, we see a different result. Rather than being nice and round, we see what sort of a, sort of a node globular lobe structure. Right. Now, notice how these are two different colors. This represents a phase change. Well, this would be positive and negative. Again, phase would represent sort of the, the wave-like nature, one going up, one going down. They don't make a positive charge or negative charge. This represents the phase within the structure. If they had the same phase, there would be no node, and it would be an s orbital. All right, So we've raised the energy a little, and now we have these two separate locations where you find the, 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 the electron. So we actually would not find the electron at the nucleus. It's not there. The electron, we can say that the, oh, the p orbital, the electron isn't there. It's sort of distributed either above or below the plane of the atom. So that would be an L is equal to 1 quantum number. All right, so again, these are well, you know, what we call the, the angular momentum quantum number. And they represent the shape of the orbitals. So it's the shape of the subshell, the shape of the orbitals. They're all related. Now, there are three potential locations within an L is equal to P. There's the, there's the M sub L value equal to 1, 0, and negative 1. And each of these corresponds to a different direction. We usually don't worry too much about it, but it represents the orientation with respect to the atom. So if we align our axis, so here's the x, x, y axis pointing up and down, x axis going this way, y going that way, and we put in our first one, we see that it's aligned with us. We can't see it aligned, representing up and down, and then perpendicular. So these three orbitals are orthogonal to one another. They're, and so if you were to look at all three orbitals at the same time, they would create six little lobes lo localized around the atom. So these would represent the, the three individual p orbitals within the structure. Which particular angular ma magnetic quantum number applies to uh, the py or pz I, is not something I care to have you memorize. And in the absence of magnetic field or bonding, 
doesn't really matter because they're all equivalent. Orbitals that are the same in energy or something, the word is called degenerate. When they're degenerate, they all have the same energy. It doesn't really matter. Only when you start popping in electrons do you end up with deviations. This also explains why you can put three electrons in perpendicular to one another because each of the electrons goes into a different orbital in a different orientation and so they're not interacting in the same space. Well, that's sort of key. Each of these are regions of space around the atom. So another picture of this would be the, um, the p orbitals. And so here we have our three p orbitals. Sorry, these are technically 2p, but the three different p orbitals. And they show this sort of electro scatter diagram where you have electron density. The average electron density as you move in along the axis increases, 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 decreases, decreases, de increases, 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 decreases, decreases, which would represent this lobe along the x axis. Another one aligned along the p axis. They look exactly the same, except in this case they're orthogonal to one another. You can't really tell the difference between these two just by looking. And they all, and then for the, the z orbital, the one above and below the atom, again, there's no obvious difference between them. And so while in reality they are quite globular, most textbooks and handwritten exercises will sort of exaggerate and elongate the structures to create a sort of lobe-like nature. And so if we pile all three of these on top of the same atom, we would have one aligned with the x-axis, have one aligned with the p-axis, z-axis, excuse me, and one aligned with the y-axis. And each, again, each of these rep represents a change in phase. And so these three orbitals overlap on top of one another. Of course, you must not forget that there's also an s orbital present, and this would be the 2s. And then under that is another orbital, the 1s. All right. So these orbitals sort of build up on top. Of them. And this is another reason why they get further and further away, the electrons out here in the region's probabilities. So there are our, uh, and I'll put a link to this uh, little applet to control the simulation. Now, what about the third energy level? What do the s orbitals look like? And again, again, we'll just put in a, an x slice to look at it. What we see for the third s orbital, n is equal to 3, l is equal to 0, m sub l is equal to 1, n is equal to 3, n is equal to 3, we can have l equal to 0, which would give us m sub l equal to 0. Those electrons in that particular with that particular address exist in again a spherical orbital s orbitals s orbitals they're always this sort of spherical kind of boring in some respects but again notice how there's nodes that lead away and this represents several different regions of electron density some electron density at the nucleus which is important and then the bulk of the electron density around the periphery at l is equal to one again this would be a p subshell when there would again be three different m sub l values, not anything, nothing radically different than what we'd expect for our p orbital, except for this little like there's like little tiny lobes on the inside. And again, this represents the periphery. Now, again, this is deep within the nucleus. This is in under the next closest shell. So this density is really not accessible. This is buried under uh, layers of electron density. And what we really care about are these big globular lobal structures. So we often neglect to show the nodes on shells that are higher in energy because they are buried within the nucleus. They don't really play a role in the behavior. Um, if you just close your eyes and if you sort of just ignore this, or if you zoom out far enough, so if you zoom out far enough, it looks amazingly like the p orbitals we discussed last time. So to the, the universe, it still looks like this. 
this big lobes. Right? And so we sort of neglect those little tiny lobes that are on the inside before we get to the, the bigger ones out here. All right? fact of life and dealing with orbitals. As we move out further, we see the same behavior. So even at n is equal to 10, elements that don't have them, we'd still see the same structure, you know, lobular structure distributed out into, into space. Big globs of electrons. Notice also the electron density gets more and more diffuse as it gets out there. Right. But there is a third potential location. L is equal to 2 in the third energy level. These are d orbitals. So this would be related to d orbital. Now, d orbitals, whereas the um, p orbitals have one major node, d orbitals have two major nodes. And so what happens is their orbitals picture, their orbital picture looks like that. Rather than being one single lobe, they are four lobes that arise due to two nodes. So d orbitals typically have a structure reminiscent of the p's. But whereas the p's have one phase change, the d's have two. So this would represent the location of the node. Right. And they all look very similar. Four of them look alike. What's, again, what's different is their alignment. There's one orbital that sort of stands out. So they all look sort of like this um, cloverleaf structure. Um, and uh, again, they don't look all that radically different from one another. It's just their orientation. But there is one that looks radically different. It turns out that the, the, the nodes are sort of a um, um, generate uh, rather than a, a three-dimensional X through the structure, which leads to a, a very unique, almost stereotypical, um, structure rather than being uh, four lobes, four obvious lobes, they are actually it's a ring with two lobes above and below. So it's got 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 this um, ring floating through it. And so this is sort of one of the unique orbitals that um, has the same basically. It still has two nodes. It's just they're hard to see. They have a they could run through this region of space and rotate it around the axes. It's actually quite slick. Um, yeah. So those are the d orbitals. And again, there's five. And they all sort of have this multilobular structure. And the only odd one is this dz squared version. And so we can look at our, our uh, d orbitals. And you, know, you can see that there are multiple lobes spread out. And again, this one is the odd one. It has this sort of um, ring structure in the middle. Uh, makes it sort of, it's the stereotypical d orbital, um, the one they all show, but all, most of them are actually four out of the five, actually look more like these uh, four lobe structures. Now these real, these orbitals are real, they exist, and the phase is obvious, and they actually have um, implications on, on the behavior of transition metals in particular. Right, so they show up in our and then, of course, lastly are the f orbitals, my particular favorite. Um, very complex. They have three nodes each um, distributed around the periphery. There's planar nodes that d divide the structures. Um, and then, of course, they're sort of unique. They're very pretty, but uh, they're, they're beyond the scope of this class. We don't often deal with f f's. But those take place whenever you have and the f orbitals are, are available at n is equal to 4. Those can start to populate the f orbitals. And that's also why the f orbitals begin at 4f rather than um, 6f or something like that.